Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ralph Lemster, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the second in Deutsche Börse's series of webinars on regulatory reporting issue. We're transmitting live from the Cube, which is Deutsche Börse's corporate headquarters, uh, on the vicinity of Frankfurt, and as you can see in the background, we're in the live building. We are transmitting this webinar today in order to explain to you um, the implications of new regulations, specifically MIFID II and MIFIR, and the impact these regulations have on the marketplace, on your activities as market participants. With this series of webinars, the Deutsche Börse pursues the objective of getting the information out to as many market participants as possible and to get everybody on the same level. Now, some of you, uh, particularly those who may have attended the first webinar that we did, may be familiar with some of the concepts we're going to explain. Some of you may have gone into the subject matter in more detail. Um, and if you think at some point, well, I know this already, I would like to ask you to just bear with us. Uh, there will be more information as we go along. And, of course, um, we need to keep this as basic as possible, yet as detailed as we possibly can in order to get as much information out to you as we can. We will be taking questions during this webinar. Um, we will try to answer the questions as we go along. We may not succeed in answering each and every question that you put forward. If we have any open issues left after the end of the webinar, then of course Deutsche Börse will get back to you and clarify whatever has been left unanswered. The webinar is being broadcast live, as I said, but we're also taping it, and uh, we're going to make the recording available. I'll tell you where in a moment. Now, I spoke about the objective already, and before we go into it, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists of experts today. Straight to my left, on your view to, to, your, right, to your right, is Axel Schorn. He's Head of Product Development and Management in Deutsche Börse's new regulatory services unit. It's a, it's a unit dedicated to solving regulatory issues, to providing services that help you uh, get, a, get across, that help you fulfill the requirements. And uh, he's overseeing that unit. Next to Axel, we have Silvia Kiesewalter. She's an expert on regulatory reporting. And Silvia is speaking to the market, to clients, on a daily basis, so she's acutely aware of, uh, of where problems may be and how solutions need to be tailored. And on my far end, we have Christian Müller. He's Product Development Manager at the Regulatory Services Unit, and he's involved in the product design for the APA and SI services. And as you can see, we're getting right into the, into the alphabet soup. Um, we're going to be explaining what's behind those acronyms as we go along. Now, let's have a look at today's agenda. We have structured this, um, this webinar into three main parts. The first part will deal with transparency requirements under MIFID II and MIFIR. We're going to look at what are the needs, what are the requirements, what do you need to look at. The second part, we will look at the challenges involved in adopting, uh, adjusting to these new rules, implementing them. And the third part, we will have a look at what Deutsche Börse has on offer in order to help you deal with those requirements and help you fulfill the requirements. So we'll have a look at Deutsche Börse's solutions. In each part, we will have a short presentation. We will then take questions, and we'll also have questions for you. And before we do that, let me just briefly talk about the interface we're using today, what you have on your screens. We've prepared a, a screenshot of that. Um, but if you look at your screen, you will see three parts. You have one window where you see my talking head right now, and that's, where, that's the window where you will see the presentations, you will see our panelists talk to you. The second window uh, is home to the presentation that we're using, and it's there that you will see the questions that we are going to put to you as our audience, and at that point, the window will become interactive. So you'll be able, and in fact we'll ask you to, to answer our questions either choose, by choosing one option or we have one multiple choice question by choosing several. Well, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Axel to talk about the transparency requirements that we have under MIFID 2 and MIFIR. Axel, please. Sure, thanks, Ralph. 
MIFID 2 is really a game-changing regulation, most potentially the uh, most game-changing one the European financial markets has seen. Now the uh, directive MIFID and the um, regulation MIFIA actually built upon the rules of MIFID 1. However, uh, the scope in terms of instrument coverage, reportable de details, um, the um, personal information and the complexity of the scenarios involved are far, far broader. The regulation is supposed to close the loopholes and address the weaknesses that have become apparent during the financial crisis. It uh, will bring the majority of um, non-equity products into a regulatory regime and also aims to move significant part of the OTC trading onto regulated platforms. The key rules are designed to introduce fairer, safer and more efficient markets, stronger investor protection and greater transparency. Now for the purpose of this webinar, we are going to focus on the third part, which is the transparency and we'll look into the requirements for systematic internalizers and investment firms. Um, if you joined our last webinar already, which I hope you did, um, you will already know that as Deutsche Börse Group, we're going to provide you with the regulatory reporting hub. That is, we want to take care of your present and future regulatory um, requirements and help you be compliant. Now, last time uh, we looked at transaction reporting and the services that we are going to provide as an arm. And uh, today's webinar is all about the uh, pre- and post-trade transparency um, for investment firms, as well as the special requirements for systematic internalizers, and uh, the fact that uh, we're perfectly suited to become an APA. Now, um, my colleague Christian is going to explain to you what all these acronyms mean and what the requirements are. Thank you, Axel. So let me first start with who is actually affected by the MIFID II transparency requirements. So the MIFID, the goal of the MIFID II transparency requirement is making transparent uh, details on trading, regardless of where this trading actually happened. So be it on a venue or OTC. Um, consequently, uh, MIFID II transparency, that is the publication of the trades, applies to trading venues and investment firms OTC in a very similar way. So trading venues that are regulated markets and multilateral trading facilities as they are already existing, as well as the newly created organized trading facilities. And these trading, uh, organized trading facilities will bring uh, derivatives that are currently traded OTC on a venue. Today's webinar is focused on the off-venue part of, uh, um, of transparency. That is the trade reporting for investment firms, including uh, systematic internalizers, trading OTC. So what is an investment firm? An investment firm is basically any legal person providing investment services on a professional basis. So if you're not sure if you are a MIFID investment firm or not, so we recommend contacting your national competent authority or getting some legal advice. As a general rule of thumb in Europe, uh, the sell side is mainly considered uh, MIFID trading, uh, sorry, MIFID investment firms, while on the buy side, uh, there's some insecurity about this status in the market. Investment firms that are ha having a market-making role, that trade a significant, uh, that make up a significant volume of trading in, in, in OTC, have to register as a systematic internalizer. So the market-making role was formalized under MIFID into trading on an uh, organized, frequent, systematic and substantial basis, and there will be thresholds for, for measuring all this. And once, if investment firms meet these criteria, they have to register as a systematic internalizer. A good example for 
what we expect to be a systematic internalizer would be an issuer of uh, certificates, trading, OTC, their own certificates via their own investment, uh, f sorry, for their own online portal. Let me come now to what instruments are actually covered by the MIFID II transparency requirements. For MIFID I, it was basically shares traded OTC. That is an amount of more or less 8,000 uh, securities. For MIFID II, we see a vast change of this. Basically, any instrument traded on a venue is in, in, in scope of the MIFID II transparency requirements. So that includes equities, ETFs, certificates, bonds, certain derivatives that are currently traded OTC, as well as uh, structured products and uh, emission allowances. In the context of OTC trade reporting, you can say whenever an instrument that is usually traded on, an, on a venue or also traded on a venue, then traded OTC, that is in the scope of OTC um, trade reporting. And what is the timeline? I mean, you probably um, are aware of that, that the date of uh, January 3rd, 2017 is, is history, and that uh, now the new date will be set uh, uh, by the EU Parliament following the suggestions from ESMA and the EU Commission will be set to 3rd of January uh, 2018. That is what uh, most likely the date is going to be. The date of 3rd of January 2017 uh, was basically moved because ESMA didn't have the systems ready in order to, to provide the reference data which is required for complying with the transparency requirements. Um, well, this movement of time gives, gives, more, uh, gives all of us more time for our MIFID projects. Well, Deutsche Börse is not slowing down its, uh, uh, its MIFID project here, and we don't recommend that any of you does this, because it's a highly complex task, and, well, you might need all the time for this. Thank you, Christian. We'll come back to that in a second, but before we do that, let's come to our first audience question. And what we'd like to ask you now, and as I pointed out before, the window will have become interactive now. Please select one of the following options. Do you expect your company to register as a, systemic, a systematic internalizer, an SI as we heard? Yes, I do. No, no, I don't think so. Or if you're unsure, choose option three. We'll leave you this question for a couple of minutes. And uh, whilst we're waiting for your results, uh, can I take the first question? Um, Christian, you mentioned systematic internalizers. Can you expand on that a little bit more? What is an SI and what is there to know about them? Sure, absolutely, thanks. Well, as stated before, any investment firm that, uh, uh, that has a market-making making position in a uh, specific instrument or a class of instrument um, has to register as a systematic internalizer. I said this was formalized into a way of uh, organized, frequent, systematic, and substantial basis. And there will be thresholds in order to measure this status more specifically. So that means there will be a threshold measuring um, the portion of OTC trading compared to on-venue trading for a specific invis investment firm in a specific instrument and also another threshold for the market share uh, of OTC trading uh, um, of that investment firm to the overall European market share. In the same way, the frequency will, measured, will be measured. And if an investment firm breaks these thresholds um, in a consistent way for a period of six months, then they have to register as a systematic internalizer and from the following uh, quarter on, they have to, have, uh, have to fulfill additional requirements, that is, pre-trade reporting, uh, requirements on best execution reporting, and for some instruments, they will have to report reference data to the national competent authority. Thank you very much. Sounds like quite a tall order to me. 
Now, can we have a look at the results of the poll? Now, that's an interesting one. The majority of participants say, nope, not for us. Almost 72% uh, don't think they will register. Having listened to your comments, there may be some change of mind at some time. 12.8% um, yes and unsure 15.4%. Thank you very much for that. Let's move straight on to the next question. We have a second question for the audience in this section. Having heard that the, that the deadline is going to be moved, we want to know, we would like to know from you what the impact is of that delay on your planning, on your progress with, with your projects. Um, have you been making good progress anyway, so it doesn't really matter to you? Or second option, has the delay eased the pressure on your planning timeline? So it's nice to have, it's good, but uh, you, you were making good progress anyway. Or option three, would you not have made the deadline without a delay? So in fact, it would be quite welcome. So that's the question we put forward to you. And whilst we're waiting for the results of that, can I turn, turn to Axel and put the same question to you? What's the situation at Deutsche Börse? Um, I, th I believe that Christian mentioned it before, but I think it's indeed. important to <laughs> reiterate it. Indeed, we, are, we will be ready. Yes, absolutely. We have not slowed down our project and we will be ready, be it uh, 2018 or whenever, but uh, we are on very good track, yeah, and we already have a pilot, so, you know, we're on, on, in a good mode. Sounds good. Sounds good. Be ahead of the pack. Can we have the results of the poll, please? Okay. All, close to 19% were making good progress anyway. The majority, um, almost three quarters, 70%, say, well, it was good to have the delay because it's easing the pressure. And only 10% would have said, oh, we would not have been able to make, to make that, uh, that deadline. So it's good to have the extent. Very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Now, that concludes our first session in today's webinar. Let's now move on from the requirements to the challenges. What are the challenges that are, uh, what are the intricacies of implementation and all that. And for this, I will pass on to Silvia, who will tell us about all that. Silvia, please. Thank you, Ralf. So now that we have looked at the MIFID II transparency requirements in general, we want to drill down and really see what this means specifically for systematic internalizers, in short, SIs. What do they actually need to do? For pre-trade transparency, further regulation will be published by the EU Commission in very due course. Once published, any potential systematic internalizer must evaluate the so-called delegated act for implications to their business. Investment firms must and are evaluating their obligation to register as an SI, and they might also choose to opt in in certain asset classes. There are still some open questions um, as regards to how granular that role might be. As ICE also need to develop a pre-trade publication policy, they need to think about how to make their quotes public according to the required levels. Their waivers for quote publication, simply speaking, um, orders exceeding the standard market size will be exempted. Looking at all of these challenges, as ICE need to evaluate what they want to do themselves, what they can do themselves, and what they want to outsource to a partner and they need to ensure that all the necessary information for publication is available. So let's move to the next steps for investment firms. Above all, investment firms must analyze their OTC trading. Post-trade requirements now apply to a much broader range of instruments with MIFID II, and companies must get a clear picture of their OTC trading. Once they have this clear picture of uh, the OTC trading, they can assess their future strategy towards OTC business. And that determines how they are affected as well uh, by the post-trade uh, trade transparency requirements. In any case, investment firms must report their MIFID II relevant trades via an approved publication arrangement, or in short, APA. Therefore, investment firms need to evaluate um, the upcoming uh, APA providers and they must align their systems to interface with those um, providers. As with SIs, investment firms need to ensure that necessary information, for example, specific trade information, is generated on their side. Given the fact that different systems might be used for different asset classes, this task can be quite challenging. So now that we looked at what um, investment firms and SIs 
need to do, we would like to briefly present the solutions that Deutsche Börse is developing to help you become Method 2 compliant. Deutsche Börse will offer both services for pre-trade and for post-trade transparency and cover all asset classes. SIs may use an APA-like mechanism for pre-trade transparency, whereas for post-trade transparency, it is mandatory to use an APA. We have mentioned the APA status quite often, so it makes sense to take a closer look at what that means to become an APA. So Christian, maybe you can shed some light on this, please. Absolutely, sure. Thank you, Sylvia. So APA, as Sylvia has already said, the APA is the required publication mechanism for investment firms trading OTC. And the APA has to ensure that the data is published in a similar way as it is actually done for trading venues. So the APA has to have the technical um, infrastructure in place uh, in order to ensure that the trades are published effectively and consistently and the data is dissemi disseminated to the market as close to real time uh, as possible. So this needs to be guaranteed at, at all times. So there are technical and organizational standards that the APA has to meet. For example, there need to be backup facilities that if the system goes down, uh, there is a backup system that ensures that trades are published in real time. So that is the requirement for the APA itself. The APA has also ensure um, the, uh, the standard of data that it, uh, it transmits to the market. So that means the APA has to provide for, for checks on consistency and completeness of the data. There are also checks on, on the volume of a transaction and, uh, and, and the price of the transaction. And if the APA detects any error there, the trade has to be rejected and resubmitted by the, by the investment firms. So these are the core requirements for, for the APA. One thing I want to point out here is that Deutsche Börse is definitely going to apply for the APA status, and this will happen as soon as uh, it is possible to, to apply for this status. Thank you very much, Christian. Now that brings us to the next interactive element, the next poll question which we would like to get across to you. Before we do that, Christian, I know you mentioned it, you just said it, Deutsche Börse is going to um, apply for APA status as soon as that is possible. Do you think you can be just a little bit more specific on that? What sort of timelines, what sort of dates do you have in mind in that respect? Absolutely. So first, um, uh, the APA status is given by the National Competent Authority, which is responsible for the entity uh, um, applying. In case of Deutsche Börse, uh, that is the BaFin. And then this status has an EU passporting. That meaning once uh, uh, having been granted this status, uh, um, we will be able to provide services across Europe. Um, in terms to when we really are able to apply for this status, I mean, we have already started putting together this uh, documentation. Actually, the project started end of, end of uh, last year. Um, BaFin has not yet announced a date when they will accept applications. FCA has done so. So FCA says beginning of uh, 2017, they will accept um, applications, uh, but we are confident as at the earliest possible date BaFin annou uh, announces that it will accept these applications, we will do so. But when this will be, maybe beginning of 2017 or later, we don't know yet. Thank you, but you will hit the ground running uh, as and when that happens. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you had uh, an, uh, an opportunity to read through those, uh, th this question and, and the options. I'll read them to you anyway. What do you think, what you consider to be the most difficult aspect of fulfilling the requirements for a systematic internalizer? Um, and here, 
you will have the option of uh, using multiple choice. So if you think that there's, there's more than one, click more than one. Is it the identification as to whether you are or you are not a systematic internalizer? Is it the publication of quotes? Is it the best execution quality according to the regulations, according to the definitions there? Or is it the reporting of reference data to NCAs, national competent authorities? And again, we'll leave this poll open for a, mo for a few moments for you to think about it and answer. And whilst we do that, I have another question uh, for Christian, actually. Earlier on, you mentioned the concept of a delegated act. Sounds good, but can you provide some details. What is a delegated act and why is it necessary? Absolutely. Yes. Well, the European Parliament does actually have the power to delegate some non-essential parts of legislation to the European Commission. Those are the, the delegated acts. Um, the, the idea of a delegated act is to speed up the legislation uh, process and so that the European Parliament can concentrate on policy aspects and some details are then pushed out to the, to the European Commission. So while this speeds up the le legislation process, uh, when it comes to implementation, these details are very important. Right? And this is why we often say, well, for the details, we are waiting on the delegated act, which will provide these details for certain rules, thresholds I mentioned before. So that is basically what a delegated act is and what it means for us. Okay. Thank you very much. It, again, as so, ever so often, it's all down to the detail, isn't it? Now let's have a look at the poll results. Okay, and obviously the percentages add up to more than 100 in this case because we had multiple choice. A very, very... No, it's actually... It's tied. Publications of quotes and best execution qualities both, were both voted to be the most challenging things, followed by reporting of reference data and then SI identification. Interesting. Now that concludes our second part of the webinar. We had a look at the, at the challenges and we already had a first glance at the, solution, at the solutions uh, Deutsche Börse's uh, hub has in place. We're now going to have a more detailed look at that. We're going to take a deeper look at the, at the implementation and what Deutsche Börse has on offer for you. And I'm going to hand back to Sylvia for that. Sylvia, please. Thank you, Ralph. So Deutsche Börse's MIFID II service truly offers a full service to uh, systematic internalizers. It consists of five features. Firstly, the SI identification provides you with a traffic light system that alerts you on an ongoing and quarterly basis where you approach registration criteria. Secondly, for pre-trade quote reporting, we will help you publish the quotes by using our existing infrastructure for data dissemination. We will also apply the waivers up to, um, so only publish uh, when required. And thirdly, trades need to match uh, the quotes and this needs to be proven for equities. By combining both uh, solutions for pre- and for post-trade transparency, we will facilitate that matching service too and alert you of any deviations that come up. Best execution requirements need to be complied with. Um, we will provide you with aggregated information in an automated way here. Then the last point is really the um, reference data reporting. So SIs need to report reference data for those instruments where they are an SI in and that are not admitted to trading on a trading venue. And we look into providing uh, this service too. So let's look at the MIFID II OTC trade reporting, which we sometimes also call our APA service. And this is about reporting of the trades to the market. How will we do that? We will firstly apply an instrument scope check, meaning we will only publish the instruments that need to be published. And then we will look into the reporting obligation check. That means whether we will check whether you are the right party to report to avoid double reporting here. And then the trading obligation check for derivatives serves you as a proof to demonstrate that you have not traded any derivative OTC for which there is an obligation to use a trading venue. 
The last but quite challenging feature introduced by method two is the calculation of deferrals and derivation of trade flags. The good news is that we will do this for you based on your data input. So I've provided some details on the Deutsche Börse solutions. In a nuts nutshell, we will provide a full service covering the entire process from data filtering, calculating deferrals to data publication. We will take into account regulatory changes and stay on top of evolving regulatory data. We will also make use of synergies between regulatory reporting obligations and solutions and um, be as efficient as possible in terms of data sourcing. So, um, Axel, can you elaborate why to select Deutsche Börse as a partner? Well, the answer is simple because we are the hub. We are the hub connecting you, our clients, with the regulators or in this case with the, with the market providing the transparency, and we want to do this for your current and also future reporting needs. Now, we're very, very experienced in doing so, uh, doing transaction reporting for more than 20 years. However, more importantly for this webinar, we are perfectly suited to be an APA, as this is exactly what we do for our uh, markets um, here at Deutsche Börse, be it uh, Xetra or Eurex. And we also do this for partners like, for example, the Iris Stock Exchange. Of course, we also already do have an um, OTC trade reporting service under MIFID-1. And we are already connected to all the global uh, information providers and also um, the major market participants uh, already. And since, w since we are an exchange, since we are a regulated market, we can reuse a lot of our corporate governance and infrastructure to get the APA status, for example, and to, to comply to the requirements there. Um, last but not least, uh, we, we think that we provide first-class technology that our IT delivers in-house. Our, um, our systems are scalable, reliable, and very secure. So um, just you know, to sum it all up, we are the regulatory reporting hub. Sounds like, like a well-made package indeed. Thank you very much, Axel. Now, that brings us to the last audience question, the last poll in our webinar today. And uh, again, you have three options. What we'd like to know is, in your view, what's the most valuable service regarding OTC trade reporting? Is it deferral calculation? Is it the decision if the derivative trade has to be published, or is it the decision who is the correct party to report? We'll leave that with you for a moment. Um, I have a question here, Sylvia, for you. In terms of SI identification, which we discussed earlier, um, you did mention some thresholds that are applicable in that context. Can you provide some more details on that, please? Yeah. So, yeah, Christian elaborated a little bit on that. But um, so the regulatory obligation uh, to become an SI is really tied to how engaged an investment firm is in OTC trading on own account when executing client orders. And ESMA has defined quantitative criteria around this. So there is firstly the frequency of trading, and then there's a proportion of OTC activity in comparison to the overall activity of the investment firm in an instrument and compared to the overall uh, activity in the EU. So just giving you an example for liquid bonds, for example, it's um, the frequency of trading is at least once per week. And the number of trades of the investment firms count for 2 to 3 percent or more of the totals in the EU. And that is still pending the Delegated Act. Looking at the proportion of OTC activity um, in comparison to the overall um, of the investment firm itself and within the EU, uh, those thresholds are set at 25% and at 0 0.5 to 1.5% uh, respectively. So these thresholds really mean in that um, perspective that a lot more banks might be affected than they actually uh, think. Yeah. Thank you very much. That brings us back to the result of the first poll. 
there, there may be some changes in that in that response. Um, we'll leave it here for a moment. I'd like to come back on the on the issue of deferrals. Um, can you tell us about why deferrals are required in the first place and what happens when you calculate them? Yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, the legislator wants to protect uh, large orders here and also the illiquid markets. So the general rule, however, for the APA is to publish um, as close to real time as possible. So that means for equities within one minute and uh, equity like instruments and then for non equity instruments, it's uh, within 15 minutes to start with and then later on. Um, it will be uh, five minutes. So delays in publications um, and also aggregation of information is allowed under certain circumstances. As I mentioned, um, the large and um, large and scale orders. Um, so it sounds simple in the first place, but um, those publication times vary a lot looking at uh, equities and non-equity and there are a lot of uh, special cases here. And um, so additional information needs to be attached to the trade to identify uh, those specific cases and um, uh, which are called supplemental trade flex, and we will do that. Good, good to know. Good to know to have a competent partner at your side when th things are as complicated and complex as they are. Can I have the results of that poll, please? Thank you. Uh, just over half the deferral calculation, so the question was spot on. Um, the decision whether derivative trade has to be published, 45%. And again, we had a multiple choice question. Decision who's the correct party to report is. So all of these seem to be rather relevant. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of our presentation today. First of all, I'd like to thank our panelists, our experts on the panel, Axel, Silvia, Christian. Thank you very much for, for your participation, your contribution. And I will not let you go before telling you about the next webinar, which is going to be on the 12th of May. Surprisingly, it's going to be about the regulatory reporting hub. Now, who would have thought that? We're going to look at the regulatory roadmap. We're going to look at an update on, on transaction reporting and on ARM services. As positive as electronic media are and as uh, useful as webinars such as these, um, it's important to meet in person. So if you like, if we'd like to meet Deutsche Börse's representatives, uh, you have the opportunity to do so next week at the World Exchange Congress in London, 22nd, 23rd of March, and after Easter, 12th and 13th of April in Paris at the Trade Tech 2016 Expo. And in conclusion, I'd like to draw your attention, your attention once again to, to our regulatory services landing page, which you see again at the bottom of, um, of this slide. Uh, it's on Deutsche Börse's website. There's a specific microsite that's dedicated to regulatory uh, services, regulatory reporting, where you find all the information. You can contact Deutsche Börse's experts. Um, and of course, I repeat it, you will see the recording of this live webinar. Um, once we have produced it, it will be a link will be provided there, so you can you can go back to us and watch us again. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. All that's left for me is to thank everybody. Thank you, the audience. Thank you for your questions, and I hope that we'll see you again with the next webinar on the 12th of May. With that, thank you very much and goodbye.